Hi, I'm Maury Ruffin, one of the, I'm the founder and managing director of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. And uh, we put together, I think, a very interesting luncheon program for you today. So uh, we got a lot to get through in the next few minutes, and then we need to get you downstairs for the gene therapy session, which starts at, at 1 p.m. So we're going to try and end here at about 10 of 1. So uh, we're going to go ahead and kick it off, and I'm gonna I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and that's just someone I think most of you know and are familiar with, uh, Randy Mills. Uh, Randy is, is going to introduce the program uh, this afternoon and give a little bit of background information on CIRM. They have been a, a partner of the Alliance uh, really since our inception in 2009. We've worked with them. They were one of our, our charter members, and, and we're really delighted to have Randy with us here today. So, Randy, stage is yours. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to try really, really hard to not go long. In fact, maybe even go short. I, um, I don't know how many... Everybody watched Scooby-Doo, like, growing up? Watch, yeah, I love Scooby-Doo. And so, of course, I was going to be in New York where so many famous Scooby-Doo's uh, were set. Uh, and I was going to, of course, wear my ascot until I got the email yesterday saying I couldn't wear an ascot. I had to wear a tie. So let me tell you a big difference between California and New York. You come to California, no ties. Like, wouldn't be allowed to wear a tie. In a, yeah, exactly. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. But seriously, thank you guys very much. Uh, for, uh, for having me uh, here today, and, and Maury and, and everyone at CIRM, or uh, at uh, ARM, for uh, organizing uh, a really, really uh, fantastic um, event. When I um, originally was, was thinking about CIRM and, and ARM's uh, relationship and ARM's sort of concept in general, I will tell you I was admittedly skeptical. Um, that an organization that served such a diverse uh, population of stakeholders could meaningfully serve those, uh, those same stakeholders. I'm here to tell you today, I am not skeptical uh, any longer. Um, this organization has done a fantastic job, uh, not only under uh, 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 Maury and his team's leadership, but now with Ed coming on, um, there's a new mission at, uh, there's a new mission at ARM. It's a focused, thoughtful mission that describes uh, what, the, uh, what the organization does and how it benefits its, uh, its stakeholders. And so I'm here to tell you today, uh, CIRM is a very, very proud partner, uh, sponsor, and investor in uh, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Now, with that said, um, so why is CIRM at a, at a New York Investor Day? And there's really uh, uh, two, uh, two reasons for that. One is, as I said, we are an investor in the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, the other is that we are an investor in the kinds of things that you guys do. And uh, while there is some, there's generally some uh, misconception that the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine uh, is, is only for California-based organizations, that's actually not the case. And so it's worth, uh, I, I believe, it's probably worth a little bit of your time learning a little bit more about what the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine has to offer. So we have a really clear mission, a really focused mission at CIRM, and that is to accelerate uh, uh, the, um, uh, the development of stem cell and stem cell related treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. Um, it, it doesn't have to have, it doesn't have to be from an organization based in California. So we have lots of opportunities available for uh, support and funding for people from New York or Boston or wherever in the world, actually, uh, uh, you might be. And so that's, uh, first, that's an interesting thing to understand. Second is the amount of capital we have to deploy is enormous. So we're going to be deploying about a billion dollars over the next five years into regenerative medicine therapies. Now, historically, um, one, of the, one of sort of the misconceptions about CIRM is that we are an academic uh, agency and that we almost exclusively fund academia. Um, and if you look at the numbers, it, it would almost appear to bear that out. Uh, so if you look overall at, at the amount of funding we've done, 91% of our funding has gone into academia, whereas 9% has, um, has gone into companies. But that's skewed for a number of reasons. The, the first thing we had to do at CERN was build a lot of infrastructure. So we built giant buildings that were obviously for academic institutions, and so that skewed the number quite a bit 
uh, towards, towards academia. The second thing uh, that uh, there was, was the, 10 years ago, the, 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 um, the state of the industry was a lot earlier. And so a lot of the meaningful research was, was at an earlier stage, discovery and, and translational research, which is primarily done more by, more by universities. Today, with the number of things we have and into and going into, we have, uh, we have uh, right now about 90 clinical stage programs. The, the funding uh, pendulum is swinging back uh, and back towards, towards the middle. It's really, really important for CIRM that we meaningfully engage industry uh, in, um, uh, in this process because our goal isn't just to see if we can fund some neat research, it's to actually deliver that effective therapy to populations of patients and we need uh, industry in order to be able to, be able to essentially close the, uh, close the circuit. So uh, I will um, wrap it up here. Thank you guys very much for, uh, for your attention, for your participation in this, and for your participation in the field of regenerative medicine in general. And uh, please, if you get the opportunity, uh, visit CIRM.com, or go, uh, .com, I believe. Just type in CIRM, it'll come up. Um, but we have a new website that explains uh, more of the programs we have to offer, and uh, we hope to see you in California sometime. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, uh, thanks for the update on CIRM, and we really look forward to uh, our continued collaborations together over the next several years. Uh, we're going to move on to the next part of the program, and I'm going to invite uh, Jim Douglas, who's Managing Director of Healthcare Investment Banking for Piper Jaffray, to come up to the stage and then interview our, uh, our speakers, uh, our lunchtime speakers. So, Jim? Morning. Thanks a lot for the invitation to moderate a panel here today during the lunchtime hour and joined by Carl Gordon uh, from Orbamed and Tony Sun from Aisling Capital, two of the most premier investors here in the space, both on a private capital basis as well as a um, public or IPO basis as well. So I think the insights you'll get from Carl and Tony will be well worth the price of admission here today. So i um, glad that the two of them could join us. And, you know, first and foremost, I want to thank Maury and the entire alliance for uh, putting this all together. Year three, Piper's been a sponsor along the way here, so we've seen the conference grow, and uh, I think everybody should acknowledge uh, the alliance and Maury and press presidents, including Edward, and uh, I think it goes, goes back to Gil and others here along the way. So very, very um, nice event and nice industry that's been put together over a fairly short period of time. So with that, I'm going to sit down and I guess if you can activate our microphones, we'll uh, just get right into it. So if you have trouble hearing me, uh, just let us know, but it sounds like everything's working well. To my left here, as I mentioned, is Carl Gordon, uh, who is a PhD and CFA from Orbamed and uh, founding partner of their global private equity um, group within Orbamed, senior bio biotechnology analyst at Meta and Isley prior to that, the predecessor firm, and he was a fellow at the Rockefeller University from 1993 to 1995, received his PhD in molecular biology from MIT and his BA from Harvard. Uh, he's been consistently included in the Forbes Midas list of top venture capitalists, so um, you're amongst very good company here. Tony Sun from Aisling, is a um, medicinal doctor, and Tony joined Aisling for, in 2002 and serves as um, an investment, investment partner. Previously, he was an adjunct instructor of medicine at the UPenn uh, Hospital for two years, and Tony serves as a director of Versardis and Pharmaron, previously director of Cenerex, uh, Dynova, MAP Pharmaceuticals, Paratech, and others. Uh, received his uh, MD from Temple University, and his MBA from Wharton, and his B Bachelor of Science from Cornell. 
And as I mentioned, he's a board, board certified in internal medicine. So with that, why don't I quickly just turn it over to Carl and Tony to let them tell you a little bit more about their firms and what they um, do from a fund perspective and investing strategies, both on the private and public side. Okay, great. Um, I hope this microphone is working. Sounds like it sort of is. So I'm Carl Gordon. I'm with Orbimed, and um, I'm pleased to be here, and thanks, um, uh, thanks for the invitation um, to, you know, to be part of this. Um, so Orbimed is a large healthcare investment firm. So since, and we only invest in healthcare, that's why we're a healthcare investment firm. We have about um, $15 billion under management, and we have some different classes of funds. We have funds that invest in public securities, like hedge funds and long-only funds. And then we have funds that I work on that invest in private companies, venture capital funds. We have a main fund that invests in the United States and Europe, and then we also have an Israel fund and an Emerging Markets Asia fund. And then our third product is a debt and royalty fund that will you know, do non-equity financings, generally um, you know, in revenue-based companies, um, debt-type financing or, or um, buy royalties. And we're certainly interested in the regenerative space, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. Hi, uh, Tony Sun. I'm with Aislinn Capital. Uh, we hope to grow up one day to be Orbermed Capital. Uh, we have 1.7 billion assets under management. We started off uh, as Perseus Soros. When George Soros invested in us, we've subsequently raised uh, two other funds since then. We have a multi-strat approach to healthcare investing. So that means we do private financings from Series A to Series Z. We'll also do public financings, uh, and we'll also do growth equity and leverage buyouts, structured debt and royalty instruments as well, all under the rubric of one fund. So that's where we are. Great. Well, I think we're going to look at this in two ways. One is the broader biotech sector and then drive down into regenerative medicine as well. So I think we'll set the stage with you know, some viewpoints on the broader biotech sector. And I think Piper Jaffray as a firm views this sector generally as one of the key drivers of economic growth here to the foreseeable future. And you know, we view this and buy into the philosophy that biotech will be equivalent for this century as to what computers were into the previous century. And one of the themes that we hear of um, and talk about internally is that we may be in a super cycle here where um, the global investment themes are shifting into biotech because the predictability of science has become such that the visibility into future cash flows has been much more predictable. And when we look at a re regenerative medicine, as we define as cellular therapies, gene therapies, CAR-T, you, you see that theme, and I correlate it, and I know Ted Tentoff and Josh Shimmer, who you talked to, or who have spoken on our research um, side, we correlate this to the monoclonal antibody um, sector about 15 years ago. And it took about 25 years for monoclonal antibodies to be the you know, $12 billion of revenues that Humira has today. And I was at Abbott Laboratories at that time when we acquired Humira from uh, BASF's Noel division. And you look back at Abbott's acquisition of um, Noel for $12 billion in 2000. 1999, Senecor slash Remicade was acquired by J&J &J for $5 billion. And in 2001, Amgen acquired Immucor for $16 billion to gain access to Enbrel. So these themes of tectonic shifts in healthcare are not unusual. And you see recently in 2011, Gilead acquiring Pharmacet for $11 billion, and people were taken aback. But now, at that time, Gilead was, what, $25 billion of market cap? Sovaldi is now the fastest blockbuster drug in history, and Gilead went from $25 billion of market cap three years ago to $150 billion of market cap today, based on those cash flows that I referenced earlier. Then you look at regenerative medicine, and you need to look no further than today's Selectus deal, whereby a billion dollar market cap company financed a $200 million uh, US IPO from their uh, Paris listing. And our, my desk uh, tells us that it was 10 times oversubscribed in a $200 million deal. So $2 billion of demand on that $200 million offering in CAR-T, an allogeneic approach. So you, know, you see a theme approaching here. I referenced monoclonal antibodies uh, 15 years ago as Remicade, Embrel, and Humira evolved. Now we're seeing that a little bit as CAR-T, 
gene therapies and regenerative medicine are um, starting to um, go down that development path as well. So Carl and Tony, I'd like to get your perspective as how you view the um, biotech investment horizon here over, as I referenced, the, the next century, as I alluded to, that this might be the c computer equivalent of the 21st century. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just start it off. Um, it's pretty hard to project forward a whole century, but <laughs> maybe hopefully with the uh, regenerative medicine technologies developing, um, we'll st all still be alive in it in, in a century. Maybe you, ha you know you have a company like uh, Calico, the, the Google company that you know I'm not involved in, but they're working on aging, I think. So maybe they'll uh, they'll have some good stuff going, and we can all live for another century. But um, aside from that, um, I mean, obviously, this is a super exciting time to be involved in regenerative medicine and biotech in general. I mean, I've been in this, this industry, you know, the investment side since um, 1995. And, you know, I mean, I think this is the most exciting um, time I've ever seen. Certainly, we had a, a really painful decade, as all of us in the industry know, you know, in basically from the early 2000s for the next 10 years, things were sort of sort of pretty slow. I mean, you didn't have many IPOs, you know, the pharmaceutical industry wasn't really doing that well and every, every, not, nothing was going that great, even though we all survived and kept going. But now over the last like three years, it's been incredible with the performance of so many public market stocks, you know, the revenue based companies as the ones such as, you know, you know, um, as you mentioned, like, you know, a, um, a Gilead or something like that, but also, you know, emerging companies like a Selectus. And then, um, you know, you have a lot of exciting private companies coming, up, um, coming on. So, I mean, I think that clearly this is a super exciting time to be in biotech. And, you know, if we're not all, all excited now, you know, we probably should be doing something else because I don't really think it's going get, to get much better. Uh, projecting forward, though, yeah, I mean, I think I certainly um, expect things to continue, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, a, a recognition that, as you said, that, you know, this is a, a key um, space for, um, uh, you know, for future economic growth, and, and it's going to be, I think, uh, continue to draw a great deal of interest. You know, obviously, whether we have the exact same performance we've had over the last three years, every year going forward might not be possible, or else biotech would be like the whole GDP of the world, I think. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I'm certainly optimistic. Great. Uh, maybe to start with a show of hands, or who here is on the buy side in this room? Okay, so that, that's helpful to see. So I was going to just comment and say, if you went to your family doctor this week and you asked your family doctor, what has been the practice of healthcare like? Has it changed much for you for the past 10 years? If you keep the financial grumblings aside, uh, they would probably say not much has changed. I'm still prescribing the beta blocker, still providing the metformin to my diabetic patients. I don't have a fancy Star Trek device to wave over the patient. And they'll say, it's been incremental. Things have definitely been better. There's minimally invasive surgery. There's some new drugs, but largely the same. If you talk to any of the people who raised their hands, including myself in this room, we would probably say the next 10 years are probably going to be some of the most exciting, fundamental changing, uh, par uh, paradigm shifting kind of time period. So it's how do you grapple and put the two together and say, what era are we really going to get into? And what is it that regenerative medicine is going to provide for that era? And Jim, I think you brought a very interesting point when you said monoclonal antibodies. Because that got me thinking. Because if you really take a look at the monoclonal antibody story, the first one actually that was approved was a product called Orthoclone that was done by Orthobiotech. Now, that first antibody was a fully murine antibody that was produced in 1986. So that was the first one. It took eight years later till the chimeric antibody that was actually developed called Reopro uh, by J&J &J for uh, anticoagulation. So it took eight years. So the, the excitement of what was made with Orthoclone's product, the first monoclonal antibody, took eight years for the second one to appear. And then the next one, which was then the uh, more humanized version of the antibody, was uh, I think it was um, uh, Rituxan. That was three years after that. So if you look at the progression of science, there's a lot of excitement at first, but it does take time. And the question for regenerative medicine is, have we made it to that time period where we've gone past the initial excitement phase and really, you know, mesoblast is going to show us data that's going to, you know, confound us and, you know, throw us all, you know, high-fiving for joy for what's going to happen for, you know, medical practice. Those are great points and actually leads me to my next comment here. For 
you had the show of hand on the buy side. There's a lot of CEOs in the room, too, of regenerative medicine companies, privately held and publicly held. And I know from a personal basis, we interact with many of them, and capital raising is always a um, you know, top of mind consideration for them beyond the science. And as the two of you think about investable themes within the regenerative medicine sector, what are some of the best practices you've learned? You mentioned your deep knowledge here in the monoclonal antibody space and the evolution that it takes, you know, eight years between the first approval till next and, you know, we're perhaps in called the third inning of regenerative medicine here where there's been some early approvals. Um, Glybera uh, comes, to, comes to mind here with Unicure. And, you know, we're going to see these approvals occur, but many companies are sitting in their offices thinking, I've got a better technology. Nobody's appreciative of it. How do I get capital to fund that? So are there some things that they can do from a corporate preparedness perspective beyond the science that you guys think is helpful to be public um, listed ready or financeable? So I can start. So uh, I took a look at Unicure and I, you know, shame on me, I didn't make the investment. I spoke <laughs> to the CEO for a long time. Um, I had concerns about, you know, a product that was going to be reimbursed at a million dollars of therapy or how it was going to be reimbursed. So. There's no question, I think, people are starting to see that regenerative therapy is something that can be very real. But once again, the whole point of caution is, what does it mean to be real as a drug, and what does it mean real to as a financial investment? If you look at Antisense, the first Antisense companies went public in 1991 under a lot of fanfare, and it didn't go so well for many, many years after that until obviously now it's getting kind of exciting. So I think companies can show that they've weathered the storm, They've shown the proof of concept in animals and hopefully in humans, and ultimately it's gonna be data that's gonna show the way to say, hey, listen, you know, I, I, we've solved the problems of delivery, we've solved the problems of expression, we've solved the problems of immunogenicity, and the data is gonna trump the day when people start saying, this is real, let's invest. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, fortunately for the regenerative medicine field, the you know, investment climate is in the glass half half full mode rather than the glass half empty mode. In fact, maybe the glass like nine tenths of the way full. I mean, and you know, because, you know, I think um, I did a CFA, you know, as Jim said, and you know, you learn how to do a lot of valuation stuff at doing a CFA or an MBA, but basically no one can really value anything. Everyone always does it by just looking at comparables and then you sort, you can work some spreadsheets, but you basically are looking at comparables. And so as long as you have, you know, a bluebird and a spark on the gene therapy side worth, you know, whatever they're worth, around a billion dollars, or bluebird's probably worth a lot more. And then four. Four, <laughs> yeah. wow. And then, um, is it four? I yeah. wish you hadn't told me that, because I passed on that one, too. So I, I'm going to, I don't remember. And then We you, have and, more for you. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. I'll get the next one. And then, you know, you have, you have on, the, on the T cell si side, you know, the car side, you've got Kite and Juno, I guess like three or five billion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's what investors, they, they just look at those, see those really big numbers there. And so, you know, newer companies, everyone can, are sort of validated by that value. Whereas five years ago, you know, you didn't have that. So, so it's hard to know. So basically that gives everyone, um, a, a really big foot in the door for all the other companies because all the investors, you know, as you said, like me, say that, you know, passed on Bluebird. Well, you know, I feel like a dummy, but I'll try to find the next one. So, um, you know, I think that's the first thing. But then, yeah, what do you need specifically? I mean, I think like you and I were talking about, like with a company like Selectus, maybe some differentiation, yeah. maybe, you know, a claim to do stuff a little bit different, a little bit better than, the, um, than what the leaders do, some good data. But I think really the ball is in the court of, of emerging companies in this field as long as those leaders have, um, have those substantial valuations. I think the data is something that is so important in all companies. And one of the things you've seen in the cellular therapy trials versus CAR-T and most um, explicitly in the gene therapy companies is the size of these trials. So I look at some of the cardiovascular trials in cell therapy, and these are you know 100 patient plus trials, whereas in gene therapy, Bluebird you referenced, you know, you might have nine patients that are being trialed here. And so the proof of concept is being borne out in very, very rare, ultra rare disease states, yet they're carrying market caps of $4 billion. And I'm in the camp, as I stated earlier, where this is such an important part of society, the shift to medicine so that you're not just getting incremental metformin therapy, as you alluded to, that you're actually getting functional cures. And maybe that does change the reimbursement pathway to a more amortizable, um, reimbursement scheme versus a million dollars up front, but undoubtedly the 
change in medicine and functional cures is such that these valuations, I see significant upsides. So the comment I'm trying to make here to a question is that these $4 billion bluebird market caps, and we can go through Alnylam and Isis and others that are carrying market caps off of rare and orphan rare, uh, rare diseases. Once these transition into um, diseases with prevalence rates in the millions, theoretically these market caps are going to be, you know, comparable to large pharma. And we would kind of laugh a little bit around the room, but Amgen wasn't Amgen 20 years ago, and Gilead wasn't a $150 billion market cap even three years ago. Science is a little different with Gilead, but what are your thoughts as these therapies transition from orphan diseases to just mainstream diseases, as I mentioned, prevalence rates in the millions versus the tens? Um, well, I mean, I think for one thing, you have to talk about pricing then, obviously, when you get, when you become more mainstream, it's harder to price high. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that, that will be one issue. And you mentioned pricing in general, which is something, a very important issue, I think, for, you know, all the companies of this class. And is there anyone from, like, a PBM here? I hope not, because, good, because I don't like PBMs. But, you know, you have, you know, those, no, but I, I, I'm just joking. I mean, they're doing their role sort of in the societal role of sort of pushing back on the other side. You always have to have, have to have two sides to the story. I'm just joking around. But those guys are obviously trying to put a lot of pressure on prices as much as they can. I mean, especially like in Express Scripts, you know, which those guys are everywhere Express Scripts. You know, they're always talking and complaining and pushing, trying to push prices yeah. down. So, you know, but again, that, that we're going to have to, uh, all the companies in this space are going to have to respond to that, I think, with very good data even in, in small diseases or large diseases, and real pharmacoeconomic data really trying to show that you, that you save money. Because even if you keep people alive, but those guys would have died fast, the PBM still don't want to pay for it, because they're just, you know, you, you really have to try to show that you actually save money, that they would have been alive and cost a lot to hospitals or something. Absolutely. Tony, any comments on that? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think the number one issue is going to be pricing and reimbursement. I mean, just look at the whole situation with Silvaldi. Yep. And, you know, I lived in... Philly for nine years, and I saw what was a SEPTA there. The, the transit folks sued sued the company and said your price is too high for hepatitis C treatment. You know we're going to get to those kind of questions if these therapies start broadening out to millions of people. So in addition to that, the other concern that we need to address is obviously a CMC or manufacturing issues. If these products are going to be autologous or are these products going to be allogeneic, big difference. And are we going to be able to scale these products to a large population? Uh, TBD. Absolutely, and I think the Savaldi vicara analogy is important, but I also think that industry did a nice job of solving it without government from a personal perspective, so the pricing there with Savaldi and vicara seems to be solving itself, and hopefully the same on these um, gene therapy issues as well. Maybe it becomes, as I mentioned, an amortizable reimbursement versus a million dollars up front. Oh, I'm sure a lot of government, senators, congressmen were calling the company. They were. <laughs> so um, we have just a few minutes left, and I think that the, what I'd like to close on is the M&A themes that um, I started out with. And M&A is such an important part of just keeping the financing environment healthy. And without the luxury of overheads here, I didn't want to get into a complete data dump here with people. But just, just hear me here on, um, very quickly to put a few things in perspective. Since 2010, so we're talking a little over four years, the combined total of proceeds from IPOs, um, VC crossover investments and um, venture capital investments, plus IPO or plus follow-ons. So all sources of equity capital, combined total of 87 billion dollars since 2010. Four years. Sounds like a lot of money until you realize Allergan and Pharmacyclics, two deals, was 81 billion dollars of capital recycled into the capital markets here in the last six months. So as these M&A themes um, continue. I think it helps to validate the sector as well as um, recycle capital into the market for all of us to benefit from. So we see within regenerative medicine that Big Pharma has started to put some bets into the form of partnerships as well as um, you know, some internal development. You've seen, for example here, Shire with Sangamo over the years, Janssen and uh, Capricort uh, last year, Genzyme Voyager here recently. A lot of bets being placed. Baxter spinning off Baxalta to focus on gene therapy. And the correlation I made to the computer century last, last century to biotech this century, you know, big pharma seems to be trying to avoid disruptive technologies a la Microsoft and IBM um, in the 1980s. 
And so what do you think it's going to take for us to pick up the paper one day and read a headline that says, you know, uh, p pick your favorite company that uh, is in these sectors is acquired for these $21 billion price tags, $50 billion price tags, um, because we're sitting here today thinking that $3 billion market caps are so incredible in this sector, but I think what's ultimately coming is that the cell therapy, gene therapy companies may become big pharma at some point, um, as, and these M&A targets are going to get much bigger than we're sitting here today. So what's your view on the ultimate M&A environment for regenerative medicine? I think the ultimate environment's going to be great. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take. So I think it's going to happen in two kind of bimodal distributions. You're going to get companies taken out really early for something that's very promising. And the analogy there would be a company like Moderna, which has raised an ungodly sum of close to a billion dollars on a preclinical platform. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be something very early like that, or it's going to be something very late, maybe something like a Unicure, which actually starts generating significant amounts of revenue and starts branching out their platform into other areas where they can show efficacy. So I think you're going to have this bimodal distribution, and pharma's going to have to play. And they're going to have to say, I don't want to miss out on this boat, uh, because if I do, it could be costly later. Carl? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I agree with um, Tony. I, I think. Look, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think it's going to take just a little bit of time because, you know, these pharmas are maybe, are there any pharma guys here? Maybe not the most, the sort of quick, you know, most nimble guy. I mean, so, you know, I, I think they're going to, you know, just like we, stuff takes a little time before I think they get, you know, so I, so I'm, I mean, I, I think it's going to take just a little bit of time for the pharmas, you know, they, and they took them, you know, they got into biologics. Maybe biologics were huge, and then five years later, the farmers got there. So, you know, by the time that, so I, I personally, I think it's going to take just a couple of years for the farmers to recognize, you know, the value of these, you know, new, new sorts of technology. Of course, Novartis, which you didn't mention, did go mm -hmm. big working with Carl June at UPenn in the, um, in the car space. So right. Novartis is there. Undoubtedly. But they didn't pay a lot for it. They did it early, which, which was smart. So... Does that come into your thinking as um, investors? Do you, do you look at, in, in technology-driven sectors of healthcare, do you say, what is that ultimate M&A exit, or are you purely clinical data-driven at the point of investment? Uh, we're just looking to make money. So <laughs> I don't think it's that complicated. Fantastic. It's just more, well, more, more, more uh, coming in than you put out. Yeah. Yeah. Very simple. Well, we can end on those comments yeah. there. And I don't know if there's any questions, but I know we're um, running short on time here. Great. Great. Thanks, Maury. Thank